Hello everybody, E here. Welcome back to From the Desk. Today we are talking about constructive criticism. This is going to be more of a rambling type uh, vlog, bit of advice thing, because I don't have any notes. I didn't bother writing anything up. Um, the reason for that is I want to get out some thoughts and I want them to be spur of the moment kind of deal. Um, because it, it's, it feels like my videos are better when I do it that way instead of reading off a, a list of things because um, even when I read off a list of things man I, I still forget to mention things I don't know how that works but I can have the list right in front of me on on the computer you can see the glow of the screen um, that's why it's called from the desk um, I can read it, be reading it off and I'll still skip things or miss things or maybe it's something I didn't write down so I'm just gonna go off the top of the head constructive criticism and how to use it and whether or not you should use it. Uh, first off, and I feel kind of silly, silly bringing this up, but I want to go ahead and draw the line in the sand between subjectivity and objectivity. Uh, subjectivity is, of course, someone's opinion. Um, it's what they think. Um, it is not fact. It can be fact if it is actually objective but I mean once again there's there's a there's a thin veil there um, either it's a subjective or objective uh, subjective would be if someone reads your work and goes I don't like the ending that's subjective um, because you know they didn't like where it went they somebody died that they didn't want to die that kind of thing whereas an objective opinion would be there's some information in the end of your story book whatever that is objectively wrong. It is a fact that you are wrong. Um, another way to look at this is grammar, spelling, punctuation, all, all that stuff. Um, objectively, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That is not a subjective opinion. That is the objective truth of the situation. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Where you do get that thin veil that I was talking about is if you look, if, if people are using different style manuals, like you have the Chicago Manual of Style, and there's another one, I always forget the name of it. I personally use the Chicago Manual of Style. Um, and I suggest you do too, but you can use either one. I think there's one or two. There's I know there's two. There might be a third one, um, but I only use uh, CMOS. So... If you're looking in there, uh, they say th some things about comma use being subjective. Um, and the, the reasoning for that is there are, there are authors who do not use commas or use them very, very rarely. Like uh, Cormac McCarthy, he also doesn't use uh, quotation marks. Now, some people balk at that. I don't mind it. I can tell very clearly um, he's, he writes well enough that I always know who's talking. Um, and when you don't know who's talking, you're not supposed to know who's talking. And I know that irritates some people, but it's it's the truth. I mean, that's the way his writing works. Um, and he gets rid. He said himself, he gets rid of all that extra punctuation, not to confuse people, to make but to make it easier to read. And I feel it works. Um, I always have. In fact, before I even knew he felt that way, I felt his stuff is probably some of the easiest prose to read. And that, the reason for it is you, you're not having to really pay all that much attention. Um, where people get hung up is people expect these things, and when those things aren't there because they've been taught they need to be there, it breaks them. Um, and it breaks the experience, and it makes that experience bad for them. But again, that's their subjective opinion. As long as you're getting across your your main idea and nothing is confusing, um, then you're in a good place. Uh, but then again, you've had the subjectivity side of it. Like I said, there's a thin veil there um, where people are confused because those things aren't there. So I always suggest that you 100% all of the time rely on gr gr grammar rules and spelling rules. Always go that route to make your message as clear as possible because not all of us are Cormac McCarthy. I use, I use quotation marks and commas and all that other fancy stuff. I use that because I need to. I can't write like that, man. I've tried, and every single time I've tried, even the people who love Cormac McCarthy have sent it back going, dude, you need these things. You need quotation marks and whatever. Um, another one is Victor Laval. Victor Laval's, uh, I think, uh, what is it, The Ecstatic, I think it is, and his first collection, only collection, actually, Slap Boxing with Jesus. Um or Jesus, I'm actually not sure which way it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, that collection, they don't those that book and that collection, they don't. He doesn't use quotation marks either. He uses m dashes, which is I don't even know the rules behind that one. If you guys know the rules to that one, let me know down there in the doobly doo. So, but subject. Let's get back on track here. Um, 
I, I, I sorry, I prefer these rambling videos because I it's like feels like I'm talking to you guys like we're sitting there having a you know a back and forth conversation even though there's no back and forth because I'm weird like that. But uh subjective opinions you you really have to take with a grain of salt. If somebody tells you if you have a certain vision in mind and someone tells you that that vision is wrong, um it's whatever. I mean, honestly, you either take that advice or you don't. As long as it's not, it's not objective, I say go with your gut instinct. Now, here's the problem with going with your gut instinct. That person may be right as far as the majority consensus is concerned. If that person says your ending sucks, that could mean that most of the people that read your book think your ending sucks. It could mean that all the people who read your book think your ending sucks because you have broken some kind of popular um, not opinion but some kind of popular rule that isn't written in any textbook you know or any uh, style manual so you you have to weigh things that's why I always say that you need more than one beta reader you only need one line editor um, and I explain that in my line editing video um, it may, basically you don't want the confusion of multiple people fixing something because of the different styles and whatnot you only want one line editor one content well one content editor one line editor and then you can have multiple proofreaders you can have multiple beta readers that's fine but when you're dealing with the content and the structure of the piece you only want one person for each and those two people need to be different now furthermore on to constructive criticism just because it I think this goes without saying, but just because something says something, it does not make it the rule of law. If somebody goes, I don't like the way you're doing things, even if it's constructive, even if they're trying to be nice, it, that really has no effect on whether or not you should use it. You need to take the advice as a whole and decide yourself as the creative individual whether or not you're going to use it. Um, some creative, some constructive criticism I would say never listen to would be anybody that says change your dialogue um, uh, and there's a reason for this um, if you're if you when you're writing you hear a character saying something in your head and you express those the way that you hear it in your head the only time I would say that you need to change dialogue is whether or not um, there's something objectively wrong with the dialogue uh, phonetics and vernacular and things like that man that can be that can be tough you're gonna lose a lot of readers so if somebody comes along and says hey this was hard to read you have to decide whether or not you want it to be hard to read now there is something to be said about frustrating your your reader along with uh, your character it, it lends a sense of frustration over the whole and it brings that point it's like some some books like uh was it a hundred years of solidarity and some some other ones they purposefully confuse the reader because they want the reader uh the handmaid's tale they want the reader to be confused as the characters so you're not supposed to understand everything you're supposed to be confused um and you're supposed to dive deeper instead of what's just on the surface um that's why many casual readers can't stand david foster wallace or thomas pynchon because those writers are writing for themselves to to prove points now here here's a, and and the end goal of a book does not always have to be pleasant if your goal, like my goal with the betting of boys, is to offend people, um, I want you to be offended, and I, I really wish I would get more negative reviews on it, because the book covers some topics that I myself find offensive, and it'd be nicer, it'd be nice to see more negative opinions of that book, or more warnings, like, hey, this book, you know, this book is full of, full of some hot garbage, and not, not, <laughs> not hot garbage in the way it's written, but it's the, the actual content. It's some foul, disgusting stuff, when people tell me they love that book, I, I got, I gotta be honest with you, I just kinda, Mm. It's it's one of those. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm glad you I'm glad that it was something that you read that you enjoyed that you got your money's worth. But that's not a book that I want people to enjoy. I want it to upset people and I want people to think, you know, about the double standards and all that stuff. So objectively, I didn't do anything wrong in the story, but subjectively it's some pretty awful content. Now, here's where 
the line between subjectivity and ob objectivity comes uh, into the grander scheme of publishing. When you get to a certain level of publishing, anything p beyond independent, really, you start to lose control over what kind of say you have in the finished manuscript. At the time you get to the end of end of a process, your whole book could be rewritten. Um, I had one book with a major publisher that I I can't make I can't make hide nor hair of what it used to be. It is now better. It is now a much better experience now that it is the way it is, but it's nowhere near what the beginning what that book was to begin with. Um, and that's what I submitted <laughs> and then it completely they asked for major rewrites do it this way and luckily I wasn't so attached to the story that I just collapsed also I was under contract so I couldn't do anything about it even if I wanted to I would have to break contract and pay back my advance and he's not going to do that um, so when it comes to small press up to legacy press you're going to have to deal with whether or not your publisher likes your content and if your publisher does not like your content unless it says specifically in your contract which I have nowadays I didn't have back then um, unless it says that you have control over the final manuscript there they can change anything at will uh, sometimes most of the time they'll ask you to change it but some of the time they'll just go in and change things and say here's what we did and this is what we're publishing I've had that happen to me twice <laughs> because I didn't agree with the changes um, and both of those times was with uh, my the publisher the first publisher I used under this name um, so that was that was a bad experience uh, kind of put me off of small presses altogether um, and then the dark fuse thing happened uh, they collapsed and here I am and I, I, I just don't trust small presses and until one comes along that really woos me I'm, I'm not even gonna submit you know I don't even submit to anthologies anymore because I just don't want to deal with it um, but anywho I think that's everything I hope that's something you wanted to watch for what 12 minutes uh, and I'm still going on, so I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it here. If you have any other questions or comments, or if you just want to fuss at me and tell me how wrong I am down in the comments, that's fine. Go ahead. Um, but until next time, I have been E, you have been you. This has been From the Desk. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.